record. I want to thank everyone for joining us for this talk today with Ed Sherman on the ancient food of the Mediterranean world, although he now says it's going to be more about Greece. For those of you who have been Renaissance members, you've probably been coming to his talks quite often. He's also provided so many of our talks in the Residence Center, and we hope that those will continue as well. He is offering a series that at the end, we'll hope that he'll show, share more about. Ed, would you like to start? Thank you, Mary Ellen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Back in the 80s, I spent uh, nearly three years wandering around the Mediterranean, most of my time in, in Greece. Uh, I was there to be bonding with the antiquities of the region, but we're not concerned with antiquities today. Uh, I, I was under the impression that this was sort of a, uh, a food themed series. Uh, and so I'm talking about the cuisine, if you will, of ancient Greece. Now, Full disclosure, I am not a foodie. I eat like a peasant, very simply. Um, but in Greece, it's not so much what you eat, it's where you eat. Uh, look behind me at uh, this scene. It's, it's typical of the islands and the coastal regions of Greece where Taverna are often right by the sea. Uh, can you imagine a more romantic setting for dinner for two than a candlelit table on the beach beside the Aegean Sea? Well, enough of that. Let me get to the cuisine of the ancient Greeks. And I will get my PowerPoint up here as soon as it launches. Launch. There we go. And full screen. People talk today about the Mediterranean diet as being, if not the, the healthiest, among the, the most healthy on the planet. And that Mediterranean diet is derived directly from the eating habits of the ancient Greeks, much of which was dictated by geography. Now to talk about food uh, in any period of time, that means to talk about the production of foodstuffs, their distribution, that is transportation and uh, distribution to, to diners and consumers, and finally, the consumption of food. Here is the Balkan Peninsula. This is modern Greece. This is the Peloponnesus down here. Uh, Athens is right in here in this larger peninsular area, which is called Attica, it is also part of ancient Athens. The whole area of the Balkans, as you can clearly see, is typified by steep mountains. And those are substantial mountains we're looking at. There is very little flat, fertile land for agriculture, for the growing primarily of uh, wheat or barley or oats. One area is up here in Thessaly, uh, but that was used in antiquity primarily for the rearing of horses uh, for the uh, aristocratic owners of horses throughout Greece. Today, this is an agricultural area, however. There was some little bit of agriculture uh, around the mountains in Attica, and then down in the valley of the Rhodus River, which is Sparta, uh, there was some agriculture. Some agriculture in terms of growing grain. 
because grains are essential to, to survival in the Mediterranean. But the generally the plains where there was um, flat land that could be plowed and planted uh, with uh, a reasonably thick fertile soil uh, were very small, very short, narrow plains uh, with those couple of exceptions that I mentioned. Mostly what you're talking about um, are the mountains. And the mountains presented a real challenge to the ancient Greeks uh, because you're talking about uh, precipitous uh, agricultural work and uh, thin rocky soil, which is good for almost nothing. But the Greeks met the challenge by terracing the hillsides. And this enabled them to grow olive trees, fruit trees of various sorts, vineyards, uh, vegetable gardens, and that sort of thing. But obviously, with these terraces, you couldn't grow grain uh, in any large amounts. The traditional Mediterranean triad, and this is true throughout the Mediterranean, consists of grains, either barley or wheat. Wheat is much preferred because that makes white bread and white bread uh, or white bread products were preferred by uh, the well-to-do in antiquity. Uh, again, the, the ability to grow the olive tree, to harvest olives, to make olive oil, to grow vineyards, harvest grapes, make raisins, and most importantly, wine. Was, wine was fundamental to the diet of the ancients and still is throughout the Met, most of the Mediterranean. Again, wheat bread is the staff of life. They couldn't grow wheat in this area, anywhere around the Aegean Sea, uh, in any amounts large enough to feed the growing populations of the maritime city-states in Athens, Corinth, Aena, Miletus, Samos, Chios. So every spring, uh, fleets from each one of these city-states uh, would leave the Aegean, pass through the Dardanelles, then through the Bosphorus, cross the Black Sea to uh, the Crimea and the Ukraine, which is still one of the Earth's great grain-growing regions. And we're talking bread wheat here. So this was not only in abundance, but in quali good quality the grain. Uh, the Greeks were trading manufactured goods, uh, olive oil, wines, uh, for uh, boatloads of grain to, to bring back to the Aegean, to their homelands. On a good year, when spring started early, like it has here in California this year, they might get in two trips, but most years, it was simply one shot up and back. But this could supply the grain needs of say Athens. And I'm mostly I'll be talking about Athens because that more evidence comes from the Athenian experience. But uh, to uh, produce the white flat bread, uh, otherwise known as pita bread, uh, required wheat bread and not barley, which was grown in Attica. In addition, the ancient Greeks ate a lot of beans. Fava beans, chickpeas or garbanzo beans, if you prefer, which uh, they made a, a form of hummus, uh, regular old, uh, what we used to call navy beans and lentils. They consumed lentils by the amphora fill. 
uh, lentil soup was was uh, home cooking. It was comfort food. Uh, you could even buy it in the agora uh, as uh, takeout food. So uh, lots and lots of beans were consumed. Uh, and interestingly enough, if you read the comic poets, uh, especially Aristophanes, you'll realize uh, that fart jokes were in style at the time. In addition, there were vegetable gardens, uh, not on a commercial scale, but still peasants would bring in their vegetables uh, to the markets for sale. Primarily cabbages, onions, and strangely enough, asparagus uh, were staple vegetables in antiquity. Notice there were no tomatoes in antiquity in Greece. Uh, we tend to think of the tomato as being fundamental to at least the diet of, uh, well, Italy, Greece, uh, and even the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the Levantine cities. But the tomato didn't arrive until after the discovery of the new world. For those who could afford it, uh, the well-to-do in Athens or Corinth or Miletus, um, there was meat to be had, uh, fowl, chickens, and waterfowl, geese, and ducks. Uh, the chicken arrived in Greece sometime in the seventh or maybe the sixth century. So it was a relatively new uh, immigrant into Greece. But with chicken came the egg, as it does with the waterfowl. And so eggs were an essential part of a well-balanced Greek diet. The iconic animal of ancient Greece is the goat. The goat is perfectly adapted to the landscape of Greece. The goat can go anywhere. He can climb the steepest hills and they eat anything. Uh, you go up into the foothills where people are asked to keep fire breaks around their homes these days. Uh, oftentimes they'll just order um, uh, or rent uh, a, a goat herd uh, and come in and turn them loose and pretty soon they've got a nice uh, uh, round uh, area of protection around their homes because the goats will just eat any kind of brush. It makes no difference. So the goat's a very valuable animal uh, in that respect is that he's hardy, was easy to maintain. Uh, and the goat herder, of course, uh, became part of the mythology and lore of ancient Greece. Uh, you get milk from a goat. Uh, I remember that my oldest daughter couldn't drink cow milk, and so she was put on goat milk, and it was foul, absolutely foul, so I don't recommend it, but I do recommend uh, yogurt from goat milk and feta cheese. Also, the goat produced leather, and you can see a goat skin uh, wine carrier here being uh, carried about by a satyr. Uh, also, the goat produced wool. Uh, wool here is being uh, spun into yarn by these ladies, and here the ladies are taking the yarn and spinning it, or excuse me, weaving it into uh, cloth for clothing, uh, mostly, of course, for their uh, lords and masters. Honey, for any of you who have had a Greek pastry, you know that honey is essential to the Greek diet, and it was in antiquity. 
Uh, the Greeks uh, domesticated the bees. They had beehives. This is a reconstruction of an ancient beehive. Uh, they, of course, collected wild honey. I don't know if they made any distinction between wild and domestic honey then. Uh, you can see a, a bunch of uh, probably slaves here who are trying to harvest honey. Uh, as they're portrayed on this pot. And the bee even wound up um, on some of the coins of the various cities of antiquity. Then we get into fishing, hunting, and gathering. Uh, interestingly enough, the Aegean Sea is not rich in marine life. It gets some fish who migrate through the Aegean on their way to the Black Sea and back, including tuna. Uh, not so much anymore. Uh, there are fewer fish today in the Aegean, uh, and especially the Saronic Gulf, than there were in antiquity. But there were local rock fish to be caught. Uh, octopus, of course, has always been part of the Greek diet and still is. And not so much anymore, but eels in antiquity were a staple. There were plenty of plenty of eels in the marshes of the Balkan Peninsula. Hunting was engaged in by the urban elite, the wealthy uh, who could afford to take the time and have the uh, access to hunting of wild boar, stags, and rabbits. In addition, uh, birds were probably hunted with nets, although I'm no expert on that one, I'm not, I'm not sure but it would be very difficult to hit a bird with bow and arrow or a spear. Gathering was common to uh, supplement a diet or even to bring collected goods into the marketplace. Wild pomegranates were gathered uh, when they were ripe, uh, figs in August, September is a good time for figs in Greece. Uh, they're delicious, by the way, as are the pomegranates. And of course, uh, chestnuts. Uh, during uh, autumn, uh, the Greeks had access to the chestnut. They understood its food value and would often grind it into a meal and use that a, as a sort of a, a, a breading agent. So that takes care of the production of food. It was a combination of agriculture, trade, hunting, and gathering that uh, pr produced all the various foodstuffs that were available to the ancient Greeks, especially the Athenians. Now we have to approach the idea of how do we get this, these foodstuffs to the consumers. And that was done here in the Agora of ancient Athens, which is on the north side of the Acropolis, as you can see here. This was the social and economic center of ancient Athens. Uh, much of the business of, and commerce of the ancient Athenians was conducted here. And there was, of course, a daily farmer's market, and there were permanent food shops too that were open uh, to customers who, who came to shop for uh, home consumption. There were also probably, although there's no direct evidence that there were tavernas in the Agora uh, that would have served the midday needs or the needs for, for a snack or a glass of wine uh, to the hundreds, thousands of people who gathered in the Agora each day. 
How did the foodstuffs get to the algora? Well, this is the beast of burden from antiquity. Uh, you still, uh, at least in the 80s, you still saw them coming into Athens, especially out in uh, the rural villages and in the islands. Um, there were very, relatively few cars or uh, three wheel vehicles that are used to haul goods around. So the donkeys were everywhere with uh, wicker panniers on their back carrying tomatoes and fresh vegetables to market each day. Uh, some had donkey carts and if, if you had a reasonable road uh, that you could haul a cart into Athens, into the Agora, uh, then you would use a donkey cart if you could afford both the donkey and the cart. And then of course women were uh, used to having pots or baskets balanced on their head as they carried goods to and fro um, to the, their homes and back. The market probably uh, would have looked something like this, like any farmer's market does today. Only instead of plastic containers, there they would have been um, baskets uh, made from uh, reeds of some sort uh, and because making baskets was a commercial venture and they were sold and distributed widely. Uh, again, there would have been no tomatoes, um, no, if these are papaya, they wouldn't have been there. And I was going to look up the watermelon and I forgot, but I doubt that the watermelon was present in antiquity. Uh, but I could be proved wrong on that one. Otherwise, you would have had a variety of vegetables, garden vegetables, as you see here, uh, including those I've mentioned already. And this was a free and open market, uh, just like a farmer's market is in, in most European cities today, you can still do a little bargaining if, if uh, especially if you're a local. Uh, if you're a tourist, forget about it. You're gonna pay the, the listed price. There were shops, uh, specialty shops like a butcher shop, uh, a bakery. This is a commercial bakery, uh, which would have been limited to only the very largest of the Greek cities. Uh, a fishmonger. Uh, then there would have been a shop that carried garum. Garum is a fish sauce. It's a condiment. It's uh, it's not the equivalent to, but it would be like teenagers use ketchup today and pour it over everything they eat. Uh, the Greeks, well, first of all, the Phoenicians, then the Greeks, and then the Italians learned to use gara uh, and, and used it uh, as a, uh, a sauce to season virtually bland dishes. Um, I've, I've had garum, a modern day garum, of course. It tastes like liquid anchovies, uh, very salty, very fishy. Uh, the little bits in it are uh, fermenting fish guts. That's how it's made. Uh, not terribly appetizing, but to some people's taste, it, uh, it really enhances the taste of food. There would have been at least one, if not more, dealers in wild herbs, because that was the principal way that the Greeks had of seasoning their food. And you're familiar with all of these herbs. I don't need to enumerate them, but they all grow wild in the hills of Attica and in the islands and in the, in the uh, generally in the Peloponnesus, all the southern parts of Greece. 
uh, have have the wild herbs, and it's just a matter of going out and collecting. It's just like you having a large herb garden in your backyard. There would have been a wine shop, of course, and a cheese shop because cheese was, um, although you could do uh, make your own cheese at home, it was just easier to have a professional do it and, and buy the amount of cheese that you needed for any one meal. And although I refer to feta often, uh, there were numerous other kinds of cheeses with different herbs added to the cheese itself uh, to make different flavors. But for me, Greek cheese is feta. There would have been street food in the agora. Uh, sold off a cart that looks like this. Probably would have been all varieties of street food that you could imagine, but interestingly enough, uh, in the evidence that has survived, the, the written evidence that has survived from antiquity, only two kinds of snack food, if you will, have uh, been mentioned. One is a pea soup. Uh, my guess it's probably lentil soup, but it could have been chickpea soup. It's not clear. Uh, and there was a strict prohibition about walking around eating the soup. You had to consume it right there where you bought it. I don't know why that was. Uh, you could al also mention uh, were tirapita uh, cheese pies which are still sold on the streets of Athens and are still delicious. Now, talking about snack food, uh, let me jump ahead uh, to today uh, so that you're prepared for your next trip to Greece, uh, especially in Athens. You're gonna wander around, you're tired, you're hungry, you need a snack, you're going to have souvlaki. Now, this is not a dinosaur haunch. Whoops. Uh, that is a construction of meat. I'll explain in a minute. Uh, you can see where it's been carved on down here. So you come up to a souvlaki stand and there's one on every block. Uh, they're more numerous than Starbucks in San Francisco, um, you can see where it's been carved. They'll carve off a little meat, put it in a, a wrapper like this, or maybe stick it on a skewer. And when I was there, I could get uh, a skewer of souvlaki for uh, 60, 70 cents. Uh, it's considerably more today. Um, I remember, uh, Early on, when I, I innocently asked one of uh, the Suvlaki purveyors, uh, what kind of meat? And he looked at me and said, meat. And I said, no, no, uh, uh, cow, pig, trying to explain to him what kind of meat. And he looked at me and said, meat. So the answer to your question is, this is meat. And don't be surprised if there's a little horse in here someplace. Uh, if you're really hungry and you wanna have just a, a, a lunch while you're walking around uh, Athens, get a gyro. Gyro is pita bread, as you can see here. Uh, has souvlaki in it. Uh, then you can ladle in whatever vegetables, onions and tomatoes are pretty standard and any, any sauces that you want. Uh, strangely enough, this one seems to have French fries in it. I've never experienced that form of a uh, gyro, um, but so be it. Uh, you might as well have the whole meal. It looks like a happy meal in one bundle. 
then there are uh, the big thing in Athens these days seems to be large pretzels, soft pretzels. Um, I've had them, they aren't particularly tasty, at least not to uh, my palate. But uh, chiropita are still sold on the tr streets and they are still delicious. You have the phyllo dough uh, stuffed with uh, different varieties of cheeses. So that takes care of the distribution of food. Somehow we have food in uh, the home. Uh, the home is called oikos, from which we get our word economy, uh, which means nothing more than the management of the household. So let me explain. This is a, a middle class to upper class house in ancient Athens, would have looked something like this. The kitchen is at the rear of the building. The stove and oven, of course, are outside because they didn't have venting and it was uh, a matter of fire safety to have both outside. The occupants of the kitchen were more, more than likely slaves. Uh, they were managed by the matron of the house, uh, the uh, eldest uh, woman of highest social standing in the house. On the second floor was a gynecium. This is women's quarters here. Here the women would gather uh, this would be the mother and wife and daughters and sisters of the uh, principal male of the household. Maybe there's more than one family, related family living together. Uh, sons bringing their wives into the family house. Uh, the women would gather here for gossip and um, spinning of wool, uh, weaving of cloth here, and uh, the rearing of children. Because the prime directive for the woman of the house, the mistress of the house, was to give birth and to rear legitimate male heirs. That if you if you succeeded there, uh, your weaving skills were immaterial. Your secondary job was management of the household, which meant management of the household slaves. Down here we have the andron, which is the male room um, where men gathered to socialize, uh, to dine on occasion, and I'll come back to the question of dining in just a bit. Respectable women in ancient Athens uh, were sequestered. They were confined to the echoes, the household. Um, and that was to ensure legitimacy of the male heir. Enough said on that. They were allowed out of the house under three different conditions. One having to do with religion. It has nothing to do with food. Um, if uh, they were going to help with the slaves or direct the slaves in, in going to the community fountain, the fountain house and getting water for the household, uh, they, would, they could do that as long as they were accompanied, chaperoned by slaves. Uh, in the same light, they might, uh, they just might, depending on how tolerant their husbands were, be allowed to accompany the slaves to the agora 
to do the shopping for the household. And that those were the only conditions under which they were allowed out of the house and they were never allowed out of the house unaccompanied by slaves, otherwise they were chaperoned. Breakfast for, at least for a man uh, who had to get up and get out of the house every day because no man, no real man would stay in the house during the day. He would either go engage in his work, uh, whatever labor he performed, uh, or commerce he might be involved in, or he would be in the agora uh, in social or economic situations. It was unseemly, according to the historian and philosopher uh, Xenophon, for a man to stay indoors. It was unseemly, the reverse was true. It was unseemly for a respectable woman to be seen out alone outside of the household. Anyway, breakfast for a man would have been barley cakes, a few nuts, maybe a piece of cheese, some yogurt and honey. A pretty basic breakfast. And if you think about it, uh, cereal and milk, yeah. That's about equivalent. I, I'd much prefer this, frankly. The midday meal, uh, very light uh, in comparison to our midday meals. Uh, bar, uh, barley cake again, some olives, feta cheese, and some wine out of a goat skin wine skin. That was a midday meal. And there may, might have been snacks here and there if you were in the Agra and you wanted a cup of wine and maybe a few olives to go with it, why well, that was available. The evening meal was the big meal of the day as far as consumption goes. It's a question of whether the all the members of the household ever ate a meal together. There's no clear um, evidence to answer that question. Uh, in fact, the evidence seems to point to the fact that they did uh, not eat together, that the genders did not uh, socialize even in the privacy of their own home. Um, Perhaps that's true. It, it, it seems unreasonable because you couldn't hold a symposium every night. Any rate, uh, the wealthy got meat, probably not every night, but maybe a few nights a week. Pork, mutton, sausage. Uh, for the less wealthy, but still well-to-do, uh, fish or fowl, uh, two, three, four nights a week. And then most people could afford cheese, eggs, olives, beans, vegetables, fruits, if they were available, the ubiquitous barley cakes. Uh, and uh, if you could afford them, uh, the wheat uh, fl flatbreads or, or pita bread. And of course, Venus wine. That was, a, that was an evening meal. It seems like the Greeks ate earlier than we do uh, and their evening meal. And also they would eat uh, uh, more according to the sun than, we, than a fixed time like we do. Just a brief word on the symposium because this is the most notable kind of gathering for eating and drinking known from ancient Greece. It's a symposium was sort of a halfway between a cocktail party and a dinner party. It was both, uh, a little bit of both. Its primary purpose was the consumption of wine and witty conversation or sometimes serious conversation. The participants were all males. 
Uh, women were never allowed except this young lady who's a flute player and probably a witty conversationalist because she's a hetera, uh, something like a geisha. Uh, she's trained to entertain men in all aspects, but in this particular scene, she's playing the flute. Um, so she's more than welcome. She's not a member of the household. She's a professional. Uh, and probably you would have had more than one or two or even three present at any one particular symposia. You can see their drinking cups. The Kylex is a shallow two-handled uh, drinking vessel. Uh, some of the best pottery produced by the ancient Greeks is still uh, intact. And, and these are the kylix, the, the drinking cups. Um, again, it, it, some of the symposia would have been very expensive undertakings, just like any major dinner or cocktail party can be in, in our country. Um, you would have ordered uh, special uh, ceramics uh, for the evening, uh, big bowls to mix the wine in. And by the way, the, the ancient Greeks did not drink their wine straight, depending on what the consumption on, on the evening was likely to be and how much wine the host had bought. Uh, the mixture would usually be uh, anywhere from uh, one part uh, wine to one or even two parts water. So they did cut their wine, but they drank a lot of it to make up for cutting it. Everybody ate well. Everybody who was in Athens, for instance, when the Athenians had a festival, uh, which was frequently. Uh, the calendar of the ancients were filled with festivals. Uh, all of them were uh, sacred festivals in honor of a particular god. Most often, Dionysus, the god of wine and inebriation, and altered states of consciousness. Um, but there were, there were festivals. Uh, the biggest festival of the year was the pan Athenaic Festival to honor Athena, the patron goddess of the city of Athens. But keep in mind, these were religious festivals. Religious festivals uh, include the sacrifice of dozens and dozens, sometimes even hundreds of animals on the altar to the god or goddess that was being honored. That meant that a lot of pigs, sheep, and oxen died to honor the god. Uh, they didn't waste them, they barbecued them. And it was a community barbecue. And if you were an Athenian or an Athenian resident, presumably in some cases, even some of the slaves were participating and enjoying uh, the, the free meals provided by the festivals. And some of these festivals would go on for a few days at a time. And there were a lot of festivals during the year. So th these were regular supplemental uh, feast uh, for all of the people who would show up for the feast in Athens. That concludes the a survey of the cuisine of the ancient Greeks. But let me uh, paraphrase Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine. A lot of his writings have survived and can be read today. One of the most interesting talks about good health, as he calls it, which means hygiene. Lots and lots of exercise, a moderate diet, 
and lots of good sleep. Get a good night's sleep. And all of these things put together over a period of time will produce a strong, healthy body that could be either an athlete or a warrior, both of which were necessary to the uh, identity of ancient Athens. That same diet and regime uh, would produce good, healthy young women who in turn could then produce legitimate male heirs. Now, let me talk about modern uh, Greek food in the tavernas of Athens, the islands, the coastal regions. Uh, just some hints to get you going next time you are in Greece or in Athens. First of all, uh, I, I know it's difficult. You've landed on the plane, you're tired, you're hauled into Athens, you're dumped off at a hotel. All you want to do is nap and then maybe get a bite to eat. If you can, resist the temptation to eat in hotels, to eat in tourist areas like the Plaka, uh, or even anywhere around in Dogma Square, which is the center of Athens. See if you can get yourself out to the neighborhoods, because Athens is filled with little neighborhoods that are like little villages. They're little communities everywhere. And that's where the good food is. That's where the family-run Taverna are. Uh, take this one. Um, oh, I see this is a stairway. Actually, this, lo this looks very much like the area uh, where I live, which was Streffy Hill, uh, about two miles from a walking distance from the Acropolis. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see there are a number of taverna all along this. This is a stairway leading up to the top of the hill. Uh, and this one, man, it's got a few people in it. This one looks real crowded. Uh, you might want to check this one out right here. And then another one up here. You want to find out where the locals eat. Uh, they know what good Greek food is, or else it's somebody's cousin who has the taverna. You can never quite be sure. Uh, but if, if it's a family-run taverna, and most of them were uh, when I lived there, uh, the food is going to be good. You're going to get mama's cooking. And you're going to start off with a bowl of tzatziki. That's yogurt with a little bit of onion and garlic and uh, uh, cucumber uh, mixed in it with olive oil. You see the oil in here? And then you dip in it with pita bread. Uh, it's a good way to start off accompanied by a beer or a glass of wine. Uh, then um, if, if I caution you, if mama made the domatas, get, get a plate full of domatas. They're delicious. They're going to differ from taverna to taverna, uh, but you don't want uh, commercially made domatas. Although um, Trader Joe's makes a pretty good dol canned uh, dolmata. Um, going on. Every meal starts off with koreatiki Greek peasant salad. Tomato, cucumber, uh, olives, onion, and feta cheese, oil and vinegar on top. Uh, lots of oregano. Uh, it is fundamental to the Greek diet. Uh, to me, that's comfort food. Uh, there are many a night that I had just salad, bread, and a, and a jug of wine, and uh, was happy as a clam. But you're probably hungrier than I am, or was, um, so you're going to order something familiar like musa, okay? 
Again, that's going to depend on who's making it. It's going to differ from Taverna to Taverna, but it's basically something that you'll recognize and it will probably be delicious. If by any chance you happen to be out in the islands and you're dining right near the wharf, on the wharf or on the beach, and they've got some octopus hanging around to show you that they've got fresh octopus, try it grilled, barbecue. It is delicious. It's a little hard to look at for some people, but it, it is absolutely delicious. A little more adventurous is a stew made from octopus uh, in the ink of the octopus. Uh, very rich uh, and very tasty. Well, there's lots of different dishes for you to sample. Uh, I developed a real taste for stuffed tomatoes while I was there. In fact, one day I was walking from my uh, hostel uh, down to the Acropolis and I spotted a woman. She came out of uh, her apartment building and she was holding up a platter of stuffed tomatoes. And I knew exactly, and they were cooked. And I, she was headed for the local taverna and she, she supplied the taverna with her stuffed tomatoes. So I figured if they were good enough for the taverna, they were good enough to, for me. So I followed her in the taverna, uh, smiled at the proprietor, pointed at the platter of tomatoes, and pretty soon I had a fork into one of them, and it was indeed delicious. Uh, another one of my favorites is Stefano, that's onion stew. Uh, this one pictured here has meat in it. Uh, there's a vegetarian version that's more common and one that I much prefer, but you can find both. Again, if you're in a family-run taverna, even in Athens, but especially out in the villages on the islands or in the rural areas, uh, just ask or you will be invited into the kitchen and they will show you all the dishes that they are offering that night. And they'll name each one and you won't understand them and you won't remember the names of them, but all you have to do is smile and point and you'll get a, uh, a platter or a, a dish filled with say whatever is in this pot. And it will be uh, if, if it's a family run affair, it will be delicious. And I keep emphasizing family run affair because uh, I am informed by recent travelers to Greece and to uh, really relatives who travel in much finer style than I'm accustomed to and eat in uh, restaurants that are much fancier uh, that the old rules don't apply. You don't go wandering into the kitchen um, that uh, they now have cuisine, not just food. Uh, I, I urge you to try to stay with the family run Taverna. Uh, Support your local taverna. I suppose that's a good phrase for it. There is the matter of oinous wine. Uh, if you are in a family run taverna, order the, a jug of the house wine, a half liter, a liter. It will be drinkable. Uh, sometimes it will even be very good. Um, Otherwise, uh, I guess you have to rely on uh, bottled wines, which are infinitely more expensive and probably not much better. I always found the wines, the house wine uh, was, was quite good because uh, the 
proprietor takes pride in the wine that he serves because the locals, who are the source of most of his income uh, outside of the tourist season, are going to patronize him and they don't want bad wine. And unless this is Uncle uh, Andrea's uh, wine that he happens to be pushing off on people, it will be drinkable wine. Uh, I am told by friends, relatives, who are wine connoisseurs, and I am not, uh, that the wines of Greece are eh, okay, but not terribly good. Uh, again, to my palate, they're certainly drinkable. And I did develop a taste when I lived there for Retsina, which most of you would gag on. Uh, because it has a strong uh, pine rosin uh, flavor and texture to it. Let me just point this out, this amber colored wine in this glass. I use that as a lead in to my conclusion. I urge you, desperately urge you, the next time you get to the island of Fira, or as some people call it Santorini, that's the Italian name for it, go to my famous, my most famous bar, uh, Franco's. And you get there, you want to get there around, well, depending on the time of year, but if it's summer, you're going to have uh, the sun setting uh, uh, sometime between seven and eight o'clock. So you want to be there by probably by six if you want to get one of these lounge chairs. And I did, I spent a lot of time uh, working a dig on the island of Fira and I spent almost every evening lounging here uh, with a carafe of what was called Santorini something or other, I forget the name of it, but it was an amber colored wine. It was absolutely delicious. Uh, a little plate of dolmatas or olives and feathers to go with it. Uh, sit back and watch the sun set uh, out in, in the ocean. Uh, and you can also see part of the caldera of the volcano at Fira. Interestingly enough, Franco plays classical music or played classical music. I hope he still does. And the piece he's playing on any one evening is timed to conclude. The final note will be played when the last millimeter of the sun's disc sinks into the sea fog in the west. And everyone claps because it's quite a performance. Uh, anyway, if you get to Fira, please treat yourself to an evening at Franco's. Uh, for those of you who are traveling singly, it's also an excellent place uh, to meet fellow single travelers. Um, well, enough said on that subject. So thank you for your time today. If you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Um, Mary Ellen, anything? I'm here. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? Uh, sure, I can do that. Let's see. Stop sharing. Thank you. Get rid so of fun. that. Uh, mm -hmm. Here we are. Okay. Great. So we do have some uh, some questions in the chat, and then I have uh, I wrote down a series ed. So <laughs> I, I'm going to sneak mine in. Um, uh, first, I want to go back to something you said, and that is social rank, because it wasn't until you got to the festivals that you talked about everybody could come. But how much of the story that we know of what I'm going to call the, you know, either from Homer, we found out about uh, it or from Plato or somebody that was writing later or even the cookbook, I can never pronounce his name, uh, Apicus. I right. have a book. How much do we learn there um, versus everyday people through faunal remains and archaeology? And do we know much about the slaves and the people that um, 
you, you were concentrating on Athens, what the food of what I'm going to call everyday people was. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, everyday people, the, the common folk. Yeah, the common. One, they were illiterate, so they didn't write anything. So we have, we have, don't have their stories. They didn't write journals. They didn't write letters. Uh, so we are dependent upon the writings of the literate uh, urban elite. Mm -hmm. uh, and that pretty well sums it up. There's very little mention uh, about slaves, about peasants, about common laborers who lived in Athens, who may have been citizens and had all the rights of citizenship, but they were illiterate and they didn't leave. There is some there is a definite movement in archaeology uh, to uh, do the, the archaeology of the common folk. Uh, but archaeology can only tell you so much. Uh, there is also a strong social movement today to urge historians to spend more time about um, uh, the uh, identity groups. I can't, I can't that would be the common folk, slaves, women, mm -hmm. uh, aliens who were living in Athens, that sort of people. But that's sometime in the future, we don't know now. Great, and then I do have a, a question from the chat. This is from Roger and um, I'm gonna have to un unhook some of you. If you raise your hand, I'll have to actually press something so that you can, uh, both unmute yourself and have your camera gone. Uh, when I have time, I'm going to ask Kathy Hart to co-host just in case I have to watch that. But this is from Roger Remedios to you. Any idea of how much in calories were eaten per meal or day? Did they eat that big meal late in the evening? Uh, it would have been early evening. Um, uh, calories, I have no clue. But my guess is a lot fewer calories than Americans eat today. Okay, and then um, I had um, another uh, uh, question, and I don't because you, I, I thought you, I didn't realize you're going to focus on just the Greeks. Sure. How did this food influence the like the Byzant Byz Byzantines, the Romans, and and did, how did it translate outside of Greece? I guess that's my question. Well, if if you look carefully at the diet of the ancient Greeks. It is essentially the Mediterranean diet, um, and and that uh, that applies today to all areas of the contemporary Mediterranean, except the Islamic countries, where they're not theoretically they're not consuming as much wine uh, since alcohol is prohibited. But other than that, um, and the consumption of pork, uh, that it's pretty much the same diet except you've got the introduction of novel cuisine, I guess, in, in restaurants everywhere. Great, and then we had a question from Janet Didion. And again, I welcome everyone to raise your hand if you wanna join the conversation or ask questions. Janet had a photo before one of your last photos uh, in which there are two guys holding male heads. Do you know which one I'm referring to? Uh, yes, that, that was meant to be part of a dramatic presentation because the festivals also included uh, the theatrical productions of Aeschylosophocles, et cetera. Uh, so that, that's sort of a comprehensive uh, depiction on, of a festival on that particular pot. Great. They were not cannibals, if that's what you're suggesting. And I wasn't sure. <laughs> Maybe they have a, 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 a question. Um, and so my other uh, uh, question, this is kind of very local, um, because you talked about if you go to Greece where you would eat, where would you go if you wanted to go to a Greek meal in Sacramento or in this region? Um, strangely enough, I haven't been to there was a Greek restaurant here, but it's not here any longer. I've been to more Greek restaurants in San Francisco right. uh, than I have in um, Sacramento, and I can't remember their names, frankly. 
Okay. If, if I can recommend it, and we have um, uh, other people that probably could uh, pipe up, um, but for some reason, and this is going to be an odd question because you haven't eaten at them. We have such a large Greek population. Um, the Greeks in, in Sacramento restaurant history owned almost all of the major restaurants, uh, literally, but they never opened up, quote, Greek restaurants. They always did all American. Our Greek diners today are kind of the same way. Well, we um, have a great food festival. And we have the Greek food festival, which hopefully is going to be back. You know, they're hoping to be back in September. Um, but I don't quite understand why if the food is so good, we haven't been able to establish a good restaurant. There are a couple now I might mention Cafe Europa, which is on 1537 Howe Avenue. Greek food importers, one of the few Greek restaurants that I can think of that's actually owned by somebody who is Greek. And they're at 650 Fulton Avenue. They have an outside area. We are hoping through our cook's tour that when we are vaccinated, oh. And when we have masks, we can actually um, go there. If anybody else has any recommendations, I would really appreciate it. I would too. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I did in the chat, I'm going to suggest people save the chat. There are a couple of great books that were uh, recommended for people who want to, um, to do more on this. Um, I do have one question again. Um, and until somebody else is one one last one and that was you talked about the festivals but how much in general because cer certainly when you read homer so much of food seemed to be not just festivals but everyday eating was um, I, about religious observance uh that would probably be <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> um sorry <clears throat> um, no different than some people hold hands and pray uh, a benediction before dinner here. The same sort of thing was, was probably true. We thank Father Zeus or uh, Dionysus for this food. Uh, and, and Cynthia, I don't want to put you on the spot. Cynthia and I have been doing some private emails. She just put in a note. Greeks migrated in ancient times all around the Mediterranean. They brought grapes and olives to um, plate. You can find Hellenic influences in other European cuisines. Did you want to say anything, Cynthia? Again, I don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to share. Um, I just... Uh, attended a Rhodes Scholar presentation yesterday on Southern Italy. And um, that was where many Greeks uh, migrated and they were talking about uh, a lot of the rootstock for famous Italian and French wines really came from the Greeks in the centuries before, uh, before in BC when, the, when they traveled uh, all over. So I found that really uh, Really? Absolutely. The, the Romans referred to that area, southern Italy and Sicily, as Magna Graecia, uh, yeah. Greece. And I must say, your presentation has been fantastic. And uh, I have to give tribute to uh, my Greek ancestors who taught me to cook and appreciate good food. And you're the real deal. So I appreciate everything. It was just so culturally right on. How are you doing, Otis? <laughs> I, I, I had some for lunch today. <laughs> they good were for you. Good. <laughs> I, I have to say, I make them from my own grapes. Liz. Are you really? Yes. They so freeze I, well. They, they fr yeah, they freeze incredibly, uh, uh, incredibly well. In fact, Kathy Hart is with us. Kathy. Um, Hart and I are uh, co-hosting, she's doing 99% of the work, a program called Bits and Pieces that are hands-on classes. And I have to tell you, Ed, I just suddenly realized how um, uh, the Tripodi, you, you pronounce it Tripodies or ter how, how would you pronounce what he said? T the T-Y-R-O. Oh, and that's how I, and I didn't know because I was married to an Armenian. Uh, I have a question. Maybe some of you can answer it for me. Is it is it safe uh, to freeze feta cheese? I overbought on the feta cheese. Well, the yeah. feta, feta yeah. cheese has so much salt in it that um, I've never had 
to it doesn't go bad. You don't have oh, to okay. freeze. But okay. I have um, um, right now. I have spanikopita, and uh, however you pronounce it, I always said tripodies. But how do you pronounce it again, Cynthia? <laughs> Tiropita. Tiropita. I have it in the freezer right now, and it is a wonderful dish. And with Kathy's permission, if we still have time between now and May, Kathy, I think that just doing a really simple how you roll those or do a flat. It's the same process, whether you uh, do a baklava or paklava or baklava. How do you want to pronounce it, Cynthia? I would love to do a, a cooking session either through the bits and pieces or through one of our first Friday virtual things. And maybe I'll invite Cynthia to be my advisor. I'd be <laughs> happy to help in any way. You guys are terrific. <laughs> great. Sounds and great, Mary Ellen. Yeah, what do you think? Don't you think that would be perfect? Yeah, I, well, you know, I love all that stuff. So yeah, that's and, great. Yes. Yeah, to answer Ed's question, yes, you can freeze feta cheese very well. Freeze is much better than cheddar. Oh, okay. Wonderful, Thanks. good. But how long will it last? Now, uh, one thing again, this Cynthia, I know I would keep mine in the water. I always buy it where it's got liquid. So if it stays in the refrigerator, any idea how long it will last, Cynthia? Well, I'm embarrassed to say that I get my um, feta from Costco. And I just, <laughs> you know, I love a bargain. Greeks love a bargain. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <And they're> pretty... <laughs> but from, from the uh, Sacramento Food Co-op, you can get the blocks of feta cheese also. So when Ed showed the picture of the um, marinated feta in cut into cubes, that you can get the blocks that will be cut into cubes from the Sac Co-op. What huh. Pasco says is are already broken up pieces. So uh, with your, uh, with everyone's permission, what I'm going to do is to de delay um, getting the link out to this program to everyone who registered so that I can add some of the information. Cynthia gave me some private books in her list. I have some. We will have um, a list to, of um, some of the, the television programs that you can do. I will have the Good Greek Restaurants in Sacramento will include that in the, the list. But for now, Ed, is there anything you would like to say in closing? And I know that your talk is full, the next one that you do, um, but if there's anything that you're doing that's coming up that you can let people know about. Uh, no, I'm, I'm done. I, this is the last of my uh, one-offs and then I've got the six week seminar, but I'm getting set up for fall. Uh, since we got the notice and um, let me know. If, uh, I, oh, I'm going to contact uh, Bonnie Pink. That's right. Okay. I'm right. going to contact Bonnie. Great. So I'm going to, uh, again, thank Ed. I'm going to stop the recording, but I kind of like debriefing. We're going to go into the green room for a few minutes. So some people are shy. Uh, Ed, if you can just stay even five minutes. Sure. Some people yeah. just don't like being recorded. Sure. No problem. Thank you. 